Herzlich willkommen zurück zu unserem Welcome back. And welcome to our next vlog. We're at the second day of the vlog push to talk. And it's going to be chaotic because we've got many guests already. This is going to be an interactive format. We have a large um, room and we have our presenters who will be in in a minute, we hope. So we've got many participants, and if you want to participate, go to the wiki and to the Divok page, and there's a link to the page, and you will also find a li link to the blue button room so that you can join us here. Our topic today is I've got nothing to hide, right? This is something you often hear. Because many people think if you don't do anything bad, no harm should come your way. But we will talk about how the Internet knows so much more than we think it does. And we're going to try and make it visible using images for different target groups. And now our presenters are going to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm um, working at Cyber for edu and we want to create images in people's head about the topic we're talking about today. And we are a relatively new association, and I would like to introduce the association to you. Cyber for Edu is an initiative. <laughs> an initiative that has, found, has been founded on the last Congress in Leipzig. And our idea was to repair digital education. And this is what we still want to do. So um, we're a group of people, nerds, scientists, data protectors, who um, are closely connected to the Software Foundation, Free Software Foundation Europe. And we're trying to we make available information on um, data protection and we also have other cooperation partners and um, technical infrastructure that we can offer and we also work together with Nextcloud so that we can provide alternatives to Zoom and other critical apps in terms of data protection. So if you want to get to know us better, um, you're cordially invited to our talk at 9 in the evening. And you can also find our website on the slide. Yeah. Well, so what are we going to talk about? I'm sure that you all know the problem. When you get out of the chaos bubble, you often have to explain to people what data protection is about and why we need it. And it's not always easy, because you always get these deadbeat arguments like, I've got nothing to hide. And this isn't helpful. What we want to do is talk about it in workshops, in conferences like on Big Blue Button. And we want to try and create images. Creating images is a very old tool. We've done it for thousands of years, actually, and we've had a lot of success creating images. And we want to create images that help people visualize topics like data protection and privacy. 
because normally you don't often visualize these things. And it is also for education purposes. We have different target audiences, whether it's school children or university students, parents and teachers, so those people who decide what information is made available to children. So, um, it's about the tools we're using, whether it's Microsoft Teams or Big Blue Button, which is a very important decision. And it's about trying to find ways out of our close-knit community and trying to inform people outside of that bubble. Michael is going to explain the time schedule, and after that, we would like to empty your brains so that we have space for creative imagination. So, Michael. Well, this um, talk uh, has a rather complex schedule because we are going to get into dialogue with the other participants soon. And sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> We're going to start working in small groups. So for all participants in the stream, I will give you an introduction on this um, data protection topic during the workshops in groups. I will do a little presentation that I also often hold at schools and I've compressed it a little bit, and I'm going to try and give you the highlights in 30 minutes so that it, um, we have content for those who are watching the screen and the stream and not working in groups. And then for a little bit of untightening, we have some activities. So let's look at the next slide. I would like to go back because um, we just became aware that uh, you couldn't see the slides before. Um, and I like them so much that I would still like to present them to you. For those who are on the stream and who are thinking about participating in the workshops, you are warmly invited to join us on Big Blue Button, and the link should be available in the um, on the wiki under the event. And the same goes for the game which we're going to play. So you're invited to join the Big Blue Button. We've got 25 participants so far, but we've got room for more. So our creative um, exercise, which we're going to do, it's about refreshing your memory. We're going to give you four terms and you have 30 seconds and we're going to ask you to write your associations with that term in 
the chat. So there's no good or bad or right or wrong answers. Of course, there's good answers, but um, there aren't any bad answers. There's just better answers. We're going to try this and see what we end up with in 30 seconds. Maybe we should explain the exact procedure. The idea is that you can look at the public chat on Big Blue Button, and you're all invited to jot down your associations, your ideas on the term. So after that, we will have the term and then your participations. Now it would be wonderful if the chat could be included in the screen. I can't see it at the moment. So for those who are just looking at the stream, I have no idea what you're seeing, but maybe this isn't bad. Now let's start with the first term. Michael, I need your help for a second, because I can't see it. OK, thanks. The first term is in the chat, and it's kangaroo. Mark Uwe Kling, boxing, Australia, funny, jumps, cyber. Eggs, pouch, funny, climate change, civil categories, Australia, Australia. Procreation, Outback, Zoo. I like your participations already. And if you've heard my alarm clocks, the time is out. So, in order to continue, we'll have the next. We'll have the next term. After the dash, matrix. The next term is matrix. Red pill, film, green, film, chat. Error in the matrix, glitch in the matrix, chat protocol, sunglasses, cat, fantasy, neo, maths, code, screensaver. Chat, code, maths. I think that laptops in the future will have a camera behind the screen. Okay, time's out. This has worked perfectly. So there's people who don't like maths, apparently. Okay, loosen up. Okay, let's continue with the next funny term. Data. Garden. Stealing. My. Austerity, <laughs> autobahn, important, zero and one, memory, reasons, encryption, files, oil, secure, <laughs> Lou, interesting associations. And because this was so nice and funny, we've got one last term. So let please make a break in the chat. And we'll have the last term. Apple. Byte. 
fruit, cake, pear, yummy, tree, walled garden, iPhone, pear, warm, red, cake, sin, Ein Jahr in die Regie. tree, apple, Thank you to everyone who participated. It's very nice to see so many participants and so many creative and funny answers. Even if it sounds funny, I have to interject for those who are watching us on the screen, stream, stream. We are hearing each other's and the direction, so I've got many voices on my headphones, and we will notify you if we need help. At this point, we would like to continue with the creative phase. We're going to split. We have uh, eight groups on the topics which you can hopefully see on the slide. I'll read them. Data protection, room one. Room two, um, personal rights. Room three, open source. Room four, metadata. Room five, data security. Room six, central, decentral. Room seven, big data. Room eight, algorithms. For each room, we have a moderator, a presenter who is going to help you find the rooms. And before we start, we would like to have an estimation of how many people would like to join which room so that we have a roughly equal number of participants in each room. So, Micha, please go to the public chat and look at the poll. We've made a poll in the chat where you can answer which room you would like to join. So, please enter your preference. And if we see that the participation numbers are very unbalanced, we will do a um, random distribution. But we hope that it distributes equally by itself. So, um, Happy to see that people are participating. This is very nice to see. And I hope that the names will be matched with the names in the chat in the poll. So please, in the poll, use your name from the chat. Of course, we don't care about your real name, but please use the name that um, you use in Big Blue Button for the poll so that you have the same name and we can assign you correctly. Also, thank you to our assistant team. You're doing a great job. So far, we've got nine participants. There's a trend already to be seen. Did we set a time limit? No, but we're seeing a clear trend. Also, <laughs> So, there's a big trend. Are you seeing the results? It's very interesting because we've got nearly all of the participants in groups one and two. There's one person for algorithms, but 
The rest is pretty clearly interested in data protection and personal rights. It wasn't clear to me. Because if you try to explain open source to non-nerds, normally you get answers like this is the this kind of shitty work by nerds that never works. So you see that it's very clear that you still have to explain open source. Auf die 13 teilnehmer so we've got 13 participants in the poll so far. That doesn't match with the 38 chat participants. So not everyone has completed the poll yet. So we would like to ask you to uh, complete the poll. Don't be afraid. We've got a very nice team that will guide you, so don't be afraid to join, nothing bad will happen, and you don't have to present the results in the end. Don't make false promises, I'm not joking. Yeah, I just noticed that you can't see my t-shirt, this is so bad because it's so cool. <laughs> Thank you for those cool T-shirts, but for the webcam, the logo has to be directly under the neck. Maybe even a face mask. So, what to do? We've got 13 participants, 15 meanwhile. So we're going to give you another minute on my computer clock, which is the central clock for all activities concerned today. And then I would like to ask all assistants to distribute the participants equally, because we want everyone to be happy in the end. From youth work, I know um, that the saying all the children play all games. So if, if you're interested in the topic we're talking about, you're going to be happy in all of the groups. And Micha is the only person who will remain without group membership. I thought we were talking metadata or something. You'll have to give a presentation, you know that, right? No, no, my assistant will give the presentation. I used this uh, glove to transport my webcam today. It did a splendid job. All right, so is the minute over yet? Yeah, it's over. We've got 15 participants. So, open source is a good topic, but difficult to explain. Somebody saying in the uh, chat, we didn't choose those the topics you would have wanted, maybe. But talking about open source, I'm not going to moderate this group, but yeah, I think there's many interesting aspects here. We're not going to talk about it further here, but I have a book recommendation, Anarchy of Hackers by Richard Solman. It's a great book where I learned a lot, even though I thought I knew everything about the topics and I felt like it was an eye-opener. For us, it seems so um, normal, but it isn't to be taken for granted. So I would like to leave you about now. But I need a little more help from Moni. Is there anything we have to do now, or will you just assign rooms? Everyone joins the groups on their own. 
and Raf is creating the rooms at the moment. So for those who haven't worked with this feature yet, um, you get um, a drop down list of rooms and the first room you see is not necessarily the room you have been assigned to you. So I'm going to read the room names again. Room 1, Data Protection. Room 2, Personal Rights. Room 3, Open Source. Room, room 4, Metadata. Room 5, Data Security. Room 6, Central, Decentral. Room 7, Big Data. Room 8, Algorithms. So, thank you. I'm going to say goodbye at this point and leave you alone with Michael. Okay. Yeah. Because you cannot participate in the creative part, you have the pleasure to listen to me. It says Kalos Machtschule, so Kalos does school. I derived this, this talk from a Kalos does school talk with an extract from that. It's a talk we offer to Berlin schools. What's Chaos Das School or Chaos Machule? Chaos Das School is an initiative that's active all over Germany. It's, uh, it's not all members of the CCC, but it's close to the CCC. And they do in their free time. I offer to give talks to children, but I usually not treated enough in school. Uh, usually we have a slide, what's the CCC, but I think everybody here knows what that is. And I talk here mostly as a chaos to school activist in Berlin. Yeah. What we do is we offer schools to visit them. It's usually uh, two lessons, so two hour lessons. And we have two talks that are requested very often. It's one is at on the internet where we element mostly address at elementary school children, and the other is tracks in the net, which is more for children from the eighth form or the last few years. This can be done quite deep. The idea of the talk is to, to give you a few ideas or impulses how you can, that you can use to uh, uh, how you can yeah, leave tracks in the network when you use it in everyday use that you do not want to leave behind. I start with photos, so this is the part I usually do interactively with the pupils, where I ask them to try to extract information from that picture, but what, what can you learn? from this photo about the person who made the photo and let them look where the photo, what can you see, so it's a roof, so it's, a, it's a huge and empty room that so somebody probably doesn't have a small flat and then can yeah, just look at the picture and derive things from the picture. But that's not the most interesting part in this thing, in this context. The more interesting is what other information are in this image. And this gets, uh, gets us to the so-called metadata. It's a descriptive data that every picture that comes from a digital camera or a telephone 
it contains and they are stored with the image on the telephone and people usually do not see that. The point of those data are attached to the photo, the actual file. So if you send the photo by mail or in chat, all this information are uh, distributed too. And here I want to show you a little tool where I where I uploaded the photo we have seen the presentation. But the tool is nothing really, really special. No telephone, no no hacker tool. Any telephone, any image management program can extract and show this metadata from any photo. But here you get an impression what there all in, in there is about the person who <coughs> made the photo. It's special about the device. He used to receive it's a Huawei device. You see the exposure. We see when the photo was made. We see where the photo was made. And because in the moment the photo was made, the location function of the phone was active. And so the view of the photo does know where the where the photo was made with a precision that's enough to actually locate the house or the flat. Here you see all the information that's in a photo. It's quite a lot. It's a very long list. It contains the speed, uh, direction of view, and allows quite a lot of conclusions where one should be aware of before you share a photo in any medium and probably tell the recipients of the photo things you don't want to tell them. Another thing what you can interesting is you can conclude from the descriptive information and you can see in which direction the camera was facing. So, yeah, you know what direction the, the, the image is. Uh, a simple way to avoid that is to at least the location information away is to make sure that whenever you make a photo on your telephone that the or you know, any, any digital camera, but those are used less and less. So the important thing is to make sure that the location information is switched off or to use tools that remove all those information. But, so for example, the messenger signal does. If you send a picture via messenger, signal removes all those metadata. So to protect the data of the photographer. Now, I want to stay for a moment at the topic of metadata. So, no, 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 I want to stay with the topic of pictures. So, I want to stay with the topic of pictures. There's another aspect. To come back to the actual content of the photo, that are it's even with the possibility of a telephone office, you can do quite a lot of evaluating of the photos. Maybe you know it if you take a photo and the newer telephones or produce these boxes you can see in this example here and that usually says that the telephone knows where on the phone there are faces. So a telephone can quite directly in real time uh, analyze the motive in the digital viewfinder. Can it detect faces? 
watch for that's a camera is quite an achievement because for such a computer a picture is nothing but a bunch of pixels with different colors the concept of a face or human or hair or teeth is nothing that a computer knows about it's easy for us to recognize for a computer that is not that easy but we are so far come so far that sorry wrong tab sind wir jetzt so weit, dass ähm, falschen Tab, Entschuldigung. We see, we see here. Okay. Ähm, ja, wir sehen. Ähm, oh yeah, I show you how simple. Such a picture analysis is today. I just show you some examples. The a tool that Amazon offers, not because I want to emphasize Amazon. It's just because Amazon makes it quite easy to free to do picture to test picture analysis for free. Here's a picture of a class that I found in the net. And I uploaded it, and what you can see here is that the algorithm is quite quite exact to recognize every single face in all this, in this mass of faces that you can see from all the boxes you can see here, and then gives me the possibility to click every face in the picture and then I get a detailed detailed information of what the algorithm thinks. So for 99% of things it's a face. It's quite sure that it's a female face it, and thinks it's between 18 and 30 years. It's not quite sure about if it's laughing or not in, or but it's not very a glass. This is quite, quite reliable. Here on the left, you see many other possibilities. What this solution from Amazon offers. There's a funny possibility you, you can to look for celebrities in pictures. This is, of course, all about celebrities and press, and of the press targeted. It's a nice feature for a journalist or something, but nothing. There's not much behind this, but a list of faces and names, and the possibility to quite accurately recognize them. Here can you see here Johnny Depp, a random person. I can load a random image and it works quite well. This is just a special case that could be a database with non-prominent people off behind this. The thing is, it's quite reliably can detect if somebody is in the image. And that does also work with several persons in the image. Yeah, the the delay is mostly because the image must be uploaded from my computer, not the actual analysis. So it's not actually there on the machine where the algorithm is running. You can have so things like object and scene recognition. Yes, uh, it's quite interesting. Here's a photo. You can see the algorithm can detect cars with a human, with a person. Uh, it's a person, and it's probably also a human. And so you can analyze the images by many criteria, and it's quite easy. It's a bit scary about the thing is that this 
can be done with several thousand pictures in a second. The customers of Amazon that use this solution to do real-time analysis of pictures of surveillance cameras or pub cameras that are installed in the public space to send them there. And this solution, like the solution from Microsoft or IBM or Facebook, all or large providers have solutions of this kind, so you can uh, process many images in parallel in a very short time. And yeah, that's, uh, we have to think about this. So if we look at a picture and recognize what's on it, but in that quantity at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are suddenly many new possibilities so something what I just want to sketch a bit the same thing works with videos so if you upload a film here and the algorithm recognize people like the same thing we did with the pictures, the same things that I said work with pictures, work quite as well with videos, and you can have the timestamps where in the video who appears. No, there's no difference if you have moving pictures or you have static photos. These kind of solutions work with both things quite as well. Yeah, it's a bit weird to do this talk without any interaction with the audience, but I haven't done that before. So uh, maybe uh, usually uh, people are sitting in front of me look interested, so it's sometimes a bit weird. So I'm not quite sure what to do. One, one, one thing I haven't shown. It's a variant that you can the space scenery. So can the system can say this is in a interior room, a library, and then there are books. So a short jump. We have looked at the topic of pictures and what you can do. What, you kind of, what information you can get out of an image. And so uh, if you're working with pictures and images and ask a few, you should ask a few more questions and ask yourself if they do not want to share that information in some situations. But now we do a, a jump. It's again the topic of metadata. And as an example is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is quite a lot of criticism of WhatsApp for data protection. And uh, WhatsApp also has an online function that scientists have looked at closer. And this function that looks quite attractive to users that allows you to see of your contacts in your telephone book if they are available for chat or now or not, can or could at least, I don't know, maybe it works still, could be queried automatically, like that scientists have done. Scientists have uh, done with a group of about a thousand students, have tracked the online status continuously for quite some time. So those thousand telephone numbers were continuously, every few minutes, queried and the data were aggregated and then would be analyzed. This was all anonymized. And here you can see the online activity by day of the week. So you can see that a person behind this number 
Wochentage. Obviously, was was constantly active until Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday less active, and then on Sunday we starting again to use one app. Here you see a the same person, another view. This is by the 24 hours of the day. So from midnight to midnight, you see here, yeah, you see, it gets really interesting because it can find su surprisingly many profiles where you ask, when do you do these people sleep? What do they do over the day? You obviously will see the activity does only go down between one and two o'clock. Then there's a period of rest. Of course, there are some measurement errors. The online status is not always correlated with the eyes being open or closed, but there are some correlations between online activity and that status. And so you can really ask, though well, this this window of rest is quite short, and then it starts again in the morning quite early. And you think, is this a person who's sitting in a lecture, or is it somebody who's just working, or a teacher who's just teaching math, or some other topic, and still has still a constantly high online status over the day? And then stuff that, and then in the evening, it starts to get even more active. It's quite quite interesting over the day. And you can click into this study and look at many people. Of course, there are some who use less. Yes, some learning who is at low rest at night. I hear again that they is quite active. You don't know what's happening in parallel there. You can only ask yourself, what is it? And that's the interesting part about this. I think this information is collected and stored, it's not only in the, connection, in the context of this study. And I think that this information can be quite interested by other parties who collect it and store it. And maybe this person will be sitting in a in an interview, in a job interview, and then somebody will get a bad attention scoring and nobody knows why. And the reason could be such kind of studies which sound harmless today, but it can be quite difficult, like in the context of a job interview, because you cannot be sure that can be sure that you will not be directly uh, will directly see this study, but you will just come aggregate a store and you really do not know why this where this bad score comes from and you cannot do anything about this how can do anything to change this bad evaluation because you do not know where the data come from and who actually collected and stored here this information. These are all good questions to think if you really want to use this big centralistic American companies, give, if you want to give them your data or not. Because as today is now is, is one thing, but what might happen with this data in the future is a different thing. OK. So much for metadata and WhatsApp. I would like to emphasize that although I do not like WhatsApp, this isn't primarily a WhatsApp problem. WhatsApp, of course, is a very large system because many people use it. And it can also um, use data from other apps. 
And of course, you have to get into dialogue with the providers of these solutions. Um, of course, it's important for the app um, to know other factors than just the name. But um, you should definitely be careful about which information is shared with the apps that you're using because um, you can be sure that they will be monitors, uh, monitorized at some point. And there are apps that don't do that. Now, I would like to make a quick excursion on this topic. Of course, it's a large gap between WhatsApp and Facebook. Facebook is secondary. And what I want to talk about, the primary information is that somebody gave us their account to analyze. And um, the point in the middle is the person, male, and they provided us with our account to evaluate. And if you have developer access, you can get information from this account and make this kind of network graph where you can see how the, the clustering of the profile looks like. The blue dots. If you look at it closely, there's many male participants and it's actually a football club. And there's just one woman who might be, I don't know, the physical assistant or something like that. But it's almost uniquely male. And then on the right side, we have the colleagues of that person, male dominated. And as you see, um, it was very easy to isolate the colleague group, and those are um, family. And in the family of this person, there are more women than men, because um, obviously women have a larger probability probability to get older than men. So you see that if you use algorithms on data, you can learn things and you don't have even have to do much to learn those things. So this is also an example which would be possible externally. Because as you see, Facebook has all of this data available to them at all times. And they're using this in order to create advertisement content that is relevant to your interests. And this is how um, Facebook gains the ability to um, have a high quality of advertisement placement because they get all of that information for free from its users. So in this context, we should also talk about this evaluation about likes. A study that is linked below has shown how many likes make up um, a good picture of a person. So how does how much does Facebook know about us from likes purely? So um, on average, you can say that if um, a person has 10 likes, that means that the system can um, estimate that person as well as a colleague or as a fellow student. And from 70 likes, um, Facebook can estimate your personality better than a good friend. From 150 likes, better than your family. And 
from CNN Likes better than anyone. Ah, we're seeing that the participants are returning from the workshops. All right. The reaction is telling me that the group work has finished. I would have had two more slides, but I would do those two slides. Continue. You're free to continue. All right. Then I'm going to continue with two slides. Another interesting topic or an interesting event was Cambridge Analytica, who managed quite a long time ago. To give apps to Facebook users to more than 270 million users, they gave them apps by pretending to have a lottery that you can win or other types of little games which you can play on Facebook. And 270,000 people clicked those links, and a bug on Facebook resulted in in the profile data of those 270,000 um, people being compromised. And it wasn't just those 270,000 people, but also their friends. And in the end, Eighty-seven million contacts, million contacts were forwarded to Cambridge Analytica. So if you compare that to Berlin, this is an entire part of the city, an entire quarter. So if you imagine that one part of Berlin, like one um, quarter of the city played the games, all of um, Germany became compromised. And those people didn't even know probably what they were doing to people on their network. So concluding, I would like to show you a tool which I haven't prepared entirely, obviously. So I would like to show you this is a Firefox browser in which I've installed a plugin called Lightbeam. And this plugin is able to show me which websites I open in my browser and those and how those websites interact. So I opened a few links. So I'll just click them through and load the content. And I think those are web pages that many German people use every day. And what you see here is two clusters. So that means I've um, visited seven sites, Freenet, GMX, um, Web.de, a few German newspapers, so seven websites where opened actively, and the tool shows that passively I've been on 121 third-party websites. And this is because providers use other services like JavaScript and technical components that is normal and le legitimate, but it is interesting that they are linked to each other. Normally, those are providers of advertisement content, 
And they have two advantages from this. They can provide advertisement and they also get information and can transport them between the websites. So if I clicked a few links on Freenet or maybe read my mail, I can assume that the content I've viewed are forwarded to T-Online. And the same goes for the newspapers, which are the three not, uh, nodes over there. So um, maybe the content I'm looking at in the newspaper um, is linked to what I read in my emails and vice versa. And um, you have those little helpers, those little pages that are necessary to um, provide the website content, but also collect information on us. And it is useful to have an ad filter. Let's see if can, I can do that spontaneously. So I'll close those, I'll reset the tree, and I hope that I didn't make a mistake and that I will be able to show you the effect of a an ad blocker. So let's reload the pages and look at the graph. Ah, uh, okay, it didn't work so well. We reduced the number of third party sites to 86, but you can definitely say that by using filters, app fil ad filters, I've um, been able to reduce the number of visited third party sites. So if you put more work into this and also use different kind of blockers and add-ons, then you can get better results. I forgot to activate no script, so just this one little experiment and then I'm going to free up the stream. So uh, it really hasn't gotten better, so I'll have to practice that again. So I'm done. If you're done, <laughs> let's go back. I don't know how you felt about it, but the time was very short, so we weren't able to agree on how to continue. So I hope that one group will volunteer. I was in group two, and I would just suggest that group one will start presenting. So please, someone from Group 1, would you talk about what you did? Hi, that was me. Um, I've been in Group 1. So if somebody from Group 1 wants to join discussion, you're welcome to. So we were talking about what data protection means and what problems we're facing with it. So on one hand, it became clear that data protection is important, but sometimes irritating because you have to make a lot of effort in order to be able to use content from large um, content providers. So there's many laws and regulations you have to understand and stay ahead of. And also, if I work in a company, 
often you don't know what kind of metadata you produce and sometimes you leave information you're not conscious of. So, for example, if I call a friend from work, um, that means that they could get the information. Or, for example, if I have a time tracking software and I track how many conversations with customers I have had that day, sometimes I take longer when solving a problem and then um, I'll be getting in trouble because I've um, had less customers than I should have had maybe. So the, this kind of meta information can be compromising and can get you in a bad spot. So if you have an email address at a provider and then suddenly you have a data loss and data get publicized because we've had those data leaks. Maybe they didn't want to publish the data, but um, then information is available about me, for example, about who I called. So it is very important to stay ahead and be conscious of what data and what made metadata you leave on your uh, journey through the Internet. And it is also too important to protect other people because metadata is just, it's not about just me, but also about other people. That's it. Sorry, I just put myself on mute. Thank you. Then group two. Anyone who wants to present what we did in group two, just go ahead and talk. No? I can do it. All right. Thank you. The idea we were talking about was why is it okay that sometimes I grant permission to my data and sometimes I'm adamant on leaving, um, keeping them private. For example, I don't want to use Microsoft Teams and we relatively quickly agreed on um, like the picture of a traffic light. Sometimes it makes sense to just have a red light. For example, if you're a teacher who go, who's going on a tri field trip with their students, of course they're going to stop at every red light, even if there's no car in sight. And the same person might behave very differently if there's no children around. So, you, normally you can estimate if a car um, will come or not, but it's more difficult if you're 15 years old and um, going on Facebook or Twitter and sharing content which might be very embarrassing a few years later. And if I'm a four-year-old, um, um, if, if I have a four-year-old with me, of course I'll hold on tight to its hand because it, a four-year-old is not able to estimate the danger. And of course, if I see that there's a speed trap, I'll stop at the red light. And maybe, uh, and of course this makes a difference because you behave differently if you're on camera.
vielleicht. Ähm, so, what I understand from this, explaining to a child why people behave differently at traffic lights, why do the teachers always stop at traffic lights or police offices? And why do random people? Um, often ignore red traffic lights. This is something you have to explain to children because it does make a difference. And this, you have to explain this to kids. So thank you for taking over. Now I would like to continue with group three. Two things. We didn't talk about this. Um, we will further develop this, and you're free to join us on cyber4edu.org at nine in the evening, and we will continue our discussions. Then we saw in the polls, if you say um, that we can't um, have a real result because we were so few people in the group, you can say this and it's okay. Then I would like to continue with Group 3 Open Source. Hi. We were four people in the group. We had uh, one presenter and three normal participants, and we were talking about open source. So we started with brainstorming, which you probably all did, and we thought about what does open source mean to us. And we had many terms uh, or words that were said. De data sovereignty. I don't want to name all the keywords, but for example, um, we talked about how effective is open source software. And then we had one term which led us to another topic which was um, help in the household and we would like to join up the presentations Paul do you know how we continue well we were talking about household help because um, you have many apps that have dif uh, different purposes and we had the idea that if you have a ho help in the household or um, a mechanic, um, you are very careful about giving out your key, for example, or leaving them alone in your apartment. So how do you decide who you leave your house key to and why is it different in terms of our um, personal data, in terms of, um, of the data we have on our smartphones? So the idea would be that le um, leaving your personal data open to app providers would be like leaving your house key to a household help. Yeah, because they do use a lot of our personal data and our personal space. Um, of course, our mobile phones have become personal spaces. Okay, we continued the image and we concluded that, as Paul said, it's about trust. And if you have a help in the household, you have trust, or if you know the mechanic that you're employing, you have trust. And in the end, we had uh, the image of a village where ev um, everyone knows everyone and we, we help each other out all the time. And 
the open source commu community also tries to establish this kind of trust which you have within a community. And in the end, we had this little village analogy. And this was almost before time was up. So, yeah, that was the image we concluded with a village as a um, trusted community. Yeah, that's it. This sounds very interesting and good. When I was doing youth work and people told me, what do I care about, NSA or stuff? I asked them, if you don't care about that, would you give your parents access to what to your WhatsApp? And of course, they said, oh, no, no, I wouldn't, never. So why would you give the NSA access to that data? All right, thank you. And thank you for your brilliant ideas which you brought into this talk. Metadata didn't... Um, take place, but data security did. So who would like to present? Hi. We were a relatively small group. And at first, we thought about the image of a safe. But then we decided against it because it's a relatively com um, well it, it's um, too easy for a relatively complex issue so we decided in favor of this picture which is a house and the idea was when the house is being built while it's being built you don't have um, a say in um, how it's built is imagine your parents are building the house and you as a child you don't have a say in how the house is built and later when you get older you have options like for example installing a curtain or blinds and the same goes for the internet um, looking at the internet is like looking out of your window and you can also decide in favor of um, putting down the blinds or pulling a curtain or having a semi-transparent curtain maybe um, just to just another aspect was um, security. If you start building the house, you have a naked foundation, and the first thing you usually build um, as soon as you have the walls is doors and windows, which doesn't really match with how we um, do data security. But um, we couldn't add encryption into this image. I'm just imagining two houses, one conventional house with doors and windows and all of that, and one unconventional house with no windows, no curtains, or just open wall, where would you, you would act, ask yourself, why would you have that kind of house? But you would open your door, right? You want a house without doors and windows? No, but I want my door to be able to be closed and secured. Yeah. So the analogy would be, would you like to have a house without windows or doors? So do you want to continue using Facebook, for example? Or would you go the matrix way? I think this would be worth additional discussion because it's a nice image. Thank you. This would also fit with the image of the household help. So this is all coming together, which is great. Thank you.
Let's continue with Central Decentral. Who would like to present? Uh, there were no participants, unfortunately, because of, obviously the topic was chosen very complex. And maybe um, we, we can talk about the aspect in the overall picture. All right. Moving on to big data. Yeah. We were a small group, but I think we have a nice result. So we talked about what is big data and what kind of image could you use. And an image that is often used in the upload filter debate. You have many pictures that are being used in those. They are fascinating. So as the next point of discussion, we had this. So what is a big, big data pool? This is um, private insurance like a company that um, gorges um, how, um, what, what your credibility is like. So um, if you combine this with um, data, I think we were discussing on so <laughs> this would lead to dystopia. Sorry, I didn't quite understand what he was saying. So we had other topics that were mentioned. Um, we have large containers of data, large pools of data like Facebook or Google, and then we have open source tools that um, rely on the community in order to be built up. So, big data, we have data that are not easy to be linked. And then we have technological possibilities to combine images. And we um, agreed on the image of a tattoo because um, you have a tattoo for a lifetime and the more you participate in online um, forums or in online um, media, the bigger the tattoo gets because um, it creates a bigger image of who you are to the World Wide Web. And if this tattoo is combined with um, health data, for example, or private data or problems, you should really think about whether you want this kind of tattoo. Because if you say, I've got nothing to hide, and I'm not interested in, what, uh, in what's going to happen in 20 years. The tattoo is a fitting image because um, many people are actually ashamed of tattoos they've gotten 20 years ago. And you can't do a laser therapy for a big data tattoo. So it's permanent branding. I'm just imagining a body full of Facebook and Twitter icons. And this is all linked to information like your social security number. This is getting really interesting. So you're kind of tattooing data about yourself on your body. So maybe what is written on your body isn't even true. So before you get your tattoo, you should really think about what do you want tattooed. Because if I go, when I go out now and decide on a tattoo, I can actually decide on which image. But with Facebook, actually, I can't always decide. 
So those would be those um, drunk tattoos. <laughs> I think not everyone who has a tattoo really chose their tattoo. So you should re really be aware of who brands you. So let's get to the last topic, algorithms. Did we have a group on algorithms? Yeah, we do. And we made a nice image, but yeah, here we have it. Now, I think this will look quite confusing and I'll have to explain it. I like it. I get it as a tattoo. <laughs> So, I think that could be worse to choose, <laughs> but maybe I would um, have it designed professionally. Well, you can't choose it. So, our thought was that algorithms are very abstract as a concept. So, most people don't understand what an algorithm is and what, it, what the ramifications are for our everyday life. So, we thought about how to visualize what an algorithm does, because a computer doesn't really see or understand us as a human person. So, we are essentially um, passed through a number of wheels, which you see here. A, a person comes in at the beginning and then it's taken apart by the wheels and um, separated into little chunks. And then those chunks are built back together. But whatever is parsed together from the pieces of information about us doesn't represent us, doesn't represent what um, went in on the other side. So we have a corrupted image of ourselves in the end. So it should be important to us um, how we are represented by algorithms and how algorithms see us and if that is the way we want to be seen. And to, well, this image is a bit brutal, but this is also what we wanted to show because um, algorithms can be brutal. They can rip our lives apart and press it into some kind of cookie cutter shape. So um, algorithms learn, but um, they don't learn like in a soft kind of way, but um, they actually like sharpen their knives and sharpen their gears in order to crush and separate us more precisely. Wow. This is a very complex image, so it's definitely a secondary school. I love it. It's great. Thank you. It's not an easy task to say thank you. Now, you've seen me most of the time during this talk, but um, this would be a false representation because um, many people have, participating, uh, have participated in um, preparing this talk and the activities, and I hope that I don't forget anyone. Um, so, we've had many background helpers, which I've just named, who helped prepare this workshop. So, we are pretty good on time. So, Micha, if you would like to add anything. You can use the rest of the time to do that. Okay. 
I would be happy if there's questions and also maybe we could have a final statement from the participants in the chat. How did you like this activity and the talk? What would, could we do differently next time? We would be very interested in that. This has been a big experiment from our side. Now we have the question if maybe more people would like to get on camera to make it a little bit more real. Just as an idea, questions and answers and then feedback. Hi, we've got the first camera image. So, are there any questions, comments? Just open the mic and speak. We have a question from the chat. Um, how do we develop these ideas further? You can visit our website and we will um, develop these ideas further at cyber4edu.org. So for those on the stream, yeah, just one thing. If you don't know the whiteboard thing we have here, it's it's a color feature because you can actually um, people can paint on the presentation on the slide. This um, can be very interesting. So before I pass the mic to the Herald, I would like to announce the last chance for questions. So from my side, I had a lot of fun today. It was um, stress, of course. I think everyone had a little bit of stress in their own form, and I uh, think that anyone would agree that we should do that again. This, these kind of decentral big blue button formats are very interesting. We've never had this kind of interactive workshop remotely. Maybe a fun fact would be we only had the idea of me giving the talk as a filler um, like the day before yesterday because we didn't want an empty stream or the orga team didn't want an empty stream and asked us um, to fill it. So um, this did add some stress, but in the end, I think we did something good. And we all had fun. Now, um, we're having a nice part, anticipative image in the slide. Okay. Then thank you from our side. And now we're going to pass the mic to the Herald. Back to the studio. Oh, what did I always say? No questions, comments from the audience? Okay, too bad. Herald? Bring forth the Herald. I would like to activate my camera, but I I can be a replacement herald. I've got a replacement herald here. Hi, I'm the herald. You have to find the button. 
Ja, ja. Just a second. Ja. Splendid. I'm impressed. I've never seen that many speakers and participants and everything. This is really impressive, and thank you for your participations. This has been really interesting as an experiment, and I think it's the most decentral and chaotic event we've had this weekend so far. I think it was very fascinating, the kind of uh, results we had, and I hope that in your groups and in your workshop discussions you had a lot of fun, and I love this kind of participative result. So, um, And I also liked your presentation, even though it was just meant as a filler, it was a very good way to do this. And then um, just last words, um, close your windows, close your doors and be careful who you let into your house. Just one last question, is there anything you can do to support Kaius at school? So this is your advertisement space? Yes. Kaius at school has got a website. Just Google Chaos macht Schule and you will find links to the regional um, hubs all over Germany. It's not just Berlin, but we also have other groups. Just search for us on the web and you'll find us. It's a little bit difficult at the moment because of Corona and schools are closed and all that, but it's going to get better. And we're also working on offering other formats. So you're very welcome to participate and help us. The same goes for Cyber for Edu, which has a bit of a broader foundation. You're very much welcome to participate. And maybe we can also um, help you find other groups where you could give valuable input. There's also groups that are more focused on hardware, ones that are focused on software. For example, we have EduLabs, where we have a meetup next week as well. And we're talking about OER, for example. And maybe we'll meet again at one of those places. Maybe you can participate and meet other people who are participating. Because um, who will do it if we don't do it? Imagine people are watching right now, but um, they don't know how they could participate. So what would be a typical way to participate? I would say there's no fashion in which you wouldn't be able to help. Oh, make it specific. Well, as a lawyer, I do my part. We've got teachers, we've got people who write and proofread texts. We've also got parents who participate with their view as parents. Students would also be welcome to participate. So I don't think there's a way in which which would be completely useless to us. Anything is helpful. We've got different working groups in different areas. So and those are going to get bigger rather than smaller. Students is an interesting idea because this would be a very interesting angle of view to you because um, as adults we tend to think that we know all the answers and know what we should teach students but um, this view can be very different from the students point of view so 
chaos at school shouldn't just be from adults for students, but also should include the feedback from students. And just one little thing you were talking about online learning and that um, personal visits at schools are impossible at the moment. So is there anything we, you, uh, you need at the moment? Well, in Berlin, we're actually facing the challenge of organizing schools. Um, we're using video conference formats like Big Blue Button. So one challenge is support for users because we've noticed that technology isn't the only aspect that is important, but it's also important to support um, participants personally. So support and materials, visualizing diagrams, anything you can hand to people would be helpful in order to make it more graspable and to use it really um, at school, because just setting the frame isn't the final solution. And maybe um, there could also be new or crazy ideas that would be helpful, because this, for example, has been an experiment right now. And it's it would be boring if we just continued the way we did always. So we have a broad set of challenges that we're facing right now. So your participation is always welcome, whatever it looks like. So you can see it as kind of a playground to test new ideas and aspects. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's many schools and teachers who are willing to participate. And it's always possible to find classes or teachers who would like to try out new things. So we do have a playground of sorts. Our vision is to be able to say Corona has been a catastrophe on the human scale, but in terms of education, we did learn and we did find new ways of offering education. So what we have right now is not just a crisis, but um, an opportunity to find new ways and possibilities. What a nice conclusion. So thank you to all participants. Thank you to our instructors and presenters. You did a great job. And remember, close the windows, take your belongings with you, don't smoke in the glass classroom. Well, 